Welcome to the second part of Turf Business's Question Time uh, here at St George's Park. Uh, we have a, a mixed panel this afternoon and I'm now joined by Lee Strutt from the Royal Automobile Club, Scott Brooks from the FA here at St George's Park, Charles Henderson, PSD Labo Sport and Adrian Kay from York Racecourse. Um, thank you guys for joining us and, and thank you everybody in the audience. Um, for this session our, our first question comes from uh, Ben Connell from Ipswich Town. Ben. With the reduction of available fungicides um, for us to use in the industry, is there any uh, sort of industry-led recommendations of nutrient alternatives? Did you want to pick that one up, Charles, as a consultant? Or? Not really. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, as well. I mean, certainly from our point of view, it's, it's, it's increasingly tough. I mean, I think this year has brought about the loss of, of, of the contacts, which are the contact fungicides, which are the ones that... I guess enabled us to be a bit more reactive in terms of what we did. Um, I think in terms of research, there's, there's quite a lot of commercially led research in terms of the alternatives and phosphites and things like that, which is out there. I think probably America and um, places like that is probably the best source of that and golf's probably largely better at that than we are. Um, and I guess then we go into turf grass breeding with the likes of yourself and that's really where we're up to with it but I think this year having to sit down and plan out preventative programs and what we're going to do inside high pressure situations made me sit back and thought we can't be reactive anymore it's, it's gone so we've just got to pick out the key focus periods where we know the high intensity is so the leaf spot period so the fusarium periods and really focusing in and around them um, and so really from my point of view that it's, there's no easy answer out there. It's getting increasingly tough from that point of view. Um, as for what the combination of industry-led action on that is, I, I don't know and always feel a bit underwhelmed by the amenity forum and don't really feel anyone's having much of a fight to keep product on the market. It just seems like there's a willingness to let it go and we move on. But um, I find it within the golf sector, I found it very difficult to sit down and make a four or five year plan about what species we should have when you're living on a year to year life. You don't know what you've got coming around the corner uh, when you're living with power on you, but um, you know, Lee? Lee knows more about that. <laughs> um, I think probably one of the biggest issues that we have is, is that I guess as a general public and people who use sports facilities is we all want to jump on this environmental, be better, be better custodians of, of the lands. One of the issues that we're really facing is is that, but people don't want a change in quality and standards. They want us to move forward. But some of these tools are being taken away, and it's how can we guarantee something better when the alternatives that we have at the moment are not proven and they're going to be costly. Um, it's more of what can we do, but actually what more what can we do with the product to make it better? And I think certainly. Or, you know, the conversation earlier on about education and having a better idea about diseases and how products use um, how products are used to, to maximise some sort of resistance. Um, but it's it's communicating this to our customers to say actually the standards are going to change. And I think I, I can't see having these products withdrawn how we can guarantee the same level of um, success. So I, I think it's it's going to be hard, bloody hard. Really, Adrian, you've got a different challenge with a race course. Um, yeah, more not the fungicides, but more insecticides. Um, obviously, with the Celeprin, getting the emergency license has been helpful from us, but it's still a, a very expensive product that you you can you know you can put down only at a certain time. Um, it is tough, and you know I've seen the damage what what it can cause, and from a not just from a player safety but from horse safety as well as from the jockey safety and it's it's you have to spray and if you don't spray you're trying to be proactive rather than reactive because once you've got the once you've got an attack of it it's too late okay. Scott you've again got a bit of a different challenge with a few different pitches here yeah certainly um I think it it's actually um, sort of forced me to, to be a little bit more proactive and start thinking you know, more culturally about how we can, can manage the disease. And um, I'd say 
I've had to look at things from a different approach, a different angle, and start thinking about you know soil health and stuff like that to, to ensure that you know when these d disease pressures are high, um, that we're not so reliant on the on the fungicide to help us out. So I'd say if you embrace the challenge, like you know, I'm probably a, a, a better groundsman now than I was two years ago because I know yeah, that I I'm not going to be able to rely on these things to help me out. So I have to be a little bit more on the ball in terms of you know keeping you know that grass plant healthy and, and, and the area around it, you know, clean and hygienic and just so you're trying looking to more towards the, the health risk. of the plant than actually reacting to Yeah, you know, absolutely. Just because yeah. 'cause you've got to get out of jail. Yeah, and, and as a result we've probably had, you know, some of the some of the best surfaces I've worked with in the last sort of eighteen months or so. so. Oh, okay. That's um, awesome. again this year I've got a preventative programme in place, um, but I'm hoping that we don't have to utilise all of it. Um, just with the things that we've done in this renovation period in terms of soil health and, and plant health. So. Okay. So if I, if I take a sense of what I've heard from, from you guys is it's kind of get a plan together to prevent it yeah. and stop it happening. If it does happen, then what, what can you do? I, mean, I think one thing we're working quite hard is, is early identification. So with race courses, I think sort of summer and pest disease, well, early identification and accurate location. So if you take like the mm -hmm. race courses, what you've got is four or five hectares worth of land. Yeah. Um, if you want to go and treat all of that, you're going to spend 40, 50, 60 grand. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's so unfeasible. It's not there on most people's radar. So what we're trying to do is come up with ways of, of trying to pick out where that is and record where it is historically. Because generally pest, is in, 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 pest incidences occur in the same places. So we've switched, we've used a little bit of NDV up excuse me, NDVI technology in the past in order to pick out where plant stress occurs. Right. And if you can pick out plant stress early, then identify where those areas are. You can focus your preventative programs on those so it becomes more cost effective as well. Um, I think with, with stadiums, I think we're going to trial this year a couple of venues is taking out grass plants routinely and placing them in Arga Petri dishes and just locating them around the pitch and then doing that almost every second, third daily. And if, if there is pathogen there, within a day it will show, and then we whip it straight off to the lab. So we mm. know one of the games with, with disease is just a game of population and numbers. And if you can monitor where that is, then you've got an idea of when it's going to spill over and, and hit. Um, and that's what we, little things like that, little guide um, technologies like the UAV and, um, and, and light technologies that are very resource hungry to use, but if you know when to use them at the right time, is, is there. So that there's going to be little things like that, but the silver bullets are gone. That, that's well and truly for sure. And, and then you really are back to, to mechanical removal of, of organic matter. You know, is, is going to always be one of the best okay. investments in terms of disease, always. In, in terms of standardising, you know, the, the industry, like, it, it, it's, it's impossible to do. I mean, you know, what might work um, for me here out in the, you know the open of you know open fields of Staffordshire is not going to work in Wembley Stadium. Yeah. So for me and Carl to align and say, well, we're going to use these this nutrient and we and this is the program we're going to use and we're going to have this preventative program. It would just you know they're a million miles apart. You know it's, it's all turf, but you couldn't get further away from each other if you tried. So I don't think it's possible to standardise. I think it's more for you know the grounds manager to know his venue and and understand his venue and how it reacts to different you know um, pressures. Okay. Does that give you what you're looking for, Ben? Yeah. Okay. Jim. First of all, on, on Charles's point, uh, I, <coughs> I understand his view about the immunity forum. It, it has some weaknesses, not least the fact that I'm on the board of it. Um, so we can have a chat afterwards, Charles. <laughs> um, <coughs> uh, uh, and one of the reasons I got involved was because I think there are some issues with its efficacy in the industry, but it's all we've got. And I know from the inside that a lot of work is going on. But you're right. Uh, the immunity sector is significantly smaller than the agricultural sector, so we have a lot less resource and fight when it comes to chemical regulations. And then within the immunity sector, turf is again a minority part. It's dominated by the hard landscape people, so um, we're a small voice, but we're, we're, we're doing better than we used to do, in, in my opinion. In terms of the industry-led uh, initiative that I think Ben was asking about, there's something going on in golf which I hope we'll be able to inform groundsmanship as well. There's a project led by the RNA called Golf Course 2030 that is looking specifically at three areas um, that are challenging for turf, for golf course quality over the next 10 years. Charles, you've, you've, you've seen part of this. Uh, 
one of the main areas about that is, is dealing with climate change, but another, another one is regulation, chemical regulation and what's out there. And the RNA have committed to put some significant funding into and, and resource into trying to come up with um, a plan for golf course management that deals with where we are in a regulatory environment. And I think a lot of that work will, I hope, then be able to be taken on by the groundsmanship side and things, and, and hopefully there'll be some learning on both sides. All I would say, though, is I think it's going to be two maybe even three years before that project sees the light of day and is something hard and fast which which golf course owners um, and managers and particularly turf managers will have access to. Okay, great. Um, so we'll move on to, to the, the next question and here I'll bring Chris Horn in from Research Engine. What are you getting through the app, Chris? Yeah, we got a question from uh, Adam Witchell of Forest Green Rovers Football Club who couldn't be here today. Um, and he says, with the current challenges the world is facing, with the warnings on plastic and environmental issues, how are you as turf influencers addressing these in your own clubs or organisations? Okay. Is there any volunteer on that one? Is that uh, we're kind of quite a big organisation. You know, we have 17,000 members and we have our own internal uh, initiatives how to, we can reduce cardboard and plastic uses. But I think... Um, I think there has to be greater input really as end users really to suppliers of trying to work out a better solution of how we do get recycling. Um, you know, I think it's an issue that we have today and I think that we have a duty and responsibility to try and reduce that and address that. So I think it's all parties within the chain that has to do that. Okay. Are there any examples of how your particular department is, you know, that's impacting on you or you're impacting on it? Um, Really on the front line, it will be cost, um, but sometimes we have to pay the cost now to address the longer term future. And I think that there will become, I think, greater scrutiny in uh, companies. It's people going to start saying, what are you doing with your waste? Mm. And you've actually got to demonstrate and actually show what's actually happening to it. You can't just say, oh, yes, yes, we're really green mm. and nothing to back it up. And I think there will come a time where... Um, uh, organizations and, and businesses are going to have to show what are they doing with their waste and you know I think greenkeepers and groundsmen historically have always been very proactive and very good at problem solving um, and I think this is just another issue but there's also this is a great opportunity where we can showcase what we can do um, and I guess lead from the front. Okay. Um, Charles you're dealing with many different organizations is it becoming something they're putting to you to say how do we become more sustainable how do we meet these green goals? No, okay. uh, the, the majority of our work is driven by performance and yeah. standards, uh, which has surprised me. But I've had to, you get the occasional one we've, we've looked at a project uh, with one club where grass clippings was was uh, their biggest headache in terms of the biggest form of waste because they're in a, a locked urban environment. Is getting rid of grass clippings the cost of it was huge. So we've looked at a, a waste compression system. Um, so we we physically crush down and compress waste. I mean, grass has got a compression factor of, of nearly probably 90% um, in order to be able to do that. And you can take the liquid that comes out of that and recycle it back through uh, the process as well. But beyond that, it, it, surprisingly still, with everything that's occurring, it's, it's still a very Performance small request first. that comes our way. I mean, there is actually policy and legislation in around fertiliser use recording, but just so weakly enforced that it right. very rarely comes about. Okay. From our point of view, I'm sure there are other organisations that, that have to deal with that. Hey dear, are York pushing you down that direction? Uh, I think as a as a company, you know, as as a, a groundsman, I've not been pressurised to look into that. But as a company, we are obviously with single-use plastic like glasses, etc. The amount of one pint glass being used and just being thrown on the floor, which I know the company are looking at, of a reusable glass that people would purchase on the way in and use it all day. Yeah. Um, I don't think we're getting the pressure at the moment. It will come and we have to be ready for it. I'm sure that there will be legislation, knock-on effects, which will will impact mm -hmm. us in our daily... But, but nothing impacting you on a day-to-day -day turf care? Basically. No, no. Well, like, I think Charles just said, we're pretty good at you know, making proper use of everything, you know, uh, containers, uh, grass clippings, we return 95% of it on the track anyway. So it's, it, at the moment, okay. I think we do, uh, we do manage it quite well. It 
like anything, it can be improved, and I'm sure that will come. Scott, what about here at, uh, at Georges? It's a really interesting one because uh, it, the FA are putting together a sustainability strategy at the moment, and as part of that, um, we looked into our, our waste and how far it was travelling. Um, and one of the waste providers we were using um, took it 50 miles and another one took it seven miles. So obviously to reduce <laughs> the carbon footprint, we're using the one that yeah. takes it seven miles up the road. Uh, but then on the flip side of that, when you're looking at reducing fungicide usage and stuff, you're bringing in organic fertilizer and stuff like that. Well, that's coming from America. Mm. So um, I've just basically <laughs> wiped that out in one fell swoop. So yeah, it is in the mindset yeah. and you are thinking about it, but at the same time, there's a, a, lot, of, a lot that goes into it. And you know, for every positive, there's a negative. Um, and there must be a cost issue there as well, because you know, I, I don't know if the, the guy taking it seven miles or 50 miles, whether they're on the same cost basis or one had an advantage. But um, well, if you're trying to um, look after the environment, then you know the cost doesn't doesn't really come into it, does it? Um, or, or it shouldn't do. Um, but it, it, it did it did kind of make me chuckle when I thought about that. I was like, yeah. you know, we've gone we've done all this work to reduce the carbon footprint, and now. <laughs> So yeah, I was like, you know, yeah. but then really, if, if we're looking at um, sustainability in the environment within the industry, then it's up to, you know, the suppliers to, to give us the products that we need to, um, you know, to be more sustainable, really. So, and look um, at that supply chain, how it gets here. Exactly. If they could provide, it, it, that's not down to cost, that's down to the availability of the product. So yeah. if we could get that product, you know, locally, then that's what we'd do. We were just looking at um, the French sort of agronomy set, set up that we've got that it is a big requirement for them right. in terms of to the point of having to run certification <coughs> programs in and around in terms of environmental friendliness of the programs they run so I'm sure it'll come but it surprises me how little it, it comes up you know it is just right. budget and performance driven you know in terms of the requests we get. Yeah I've got a question from um, one of David's uh, Myers co-students who says, is there any ongoing or planned research into rubber crumb and deso pitches and their links to cancer and injuries? Is that something any of you guys would feel confident or happy to discuss? Yeah, but I have to sit through artificial technical committees about once a quarter, right. boring as hell. Um, <laughs> um, there, there is a lot going on in, in yeah. terms of the industry is very well organized in responding to the, to the cancer on the rubber crumb side of things, a hell of a lot. And, I think arguably they've demonstrated very, very comfortably that there's not, you know, very, very little evidence to, su to suggest that that is the categoric evidence of it. There's a second concern arising in and around microplastics as well, which is right. um, in terms of the classifications of artificials as well, which is uh, currently ongoing with the Synthetic Turf Council at, at the minute. As for DESO uh, and any stitched hybrid or carpet hybrid system yeah. there, currently flying underneath the radar right um but but legitimately they you know someone will ask the question at some point um we've looked at the use of rubber crumb and recycled rubber crumb as, as a drainage aggregate and, and any potential issues with that and for the vast majority we found very little in the way of chemical change if you like in terms of the leachate that comes out of that aggregate as well so uh, i don't know if that helps in terms of answering some of that question okay Oh, it says that there is research going on. So oh, there's, there's, there's lots. I mean, yeah. I assure you, as an industry, it's, it's, it's worth a hell of a lot of money. So yeah. they're not going to let that go. And there's alternatives. There's EPDM, there's cork. Um, alternatives to that. They're a hell of a lot more expensive. Um, but, but there are alternatives to rubber crumb as well. Yeah. Scott, you've got artificial pitches. Has that debate had an impact on you? Uh, yes, yeah, certainly. So, I mean, in the last two years, we've replaced two of our artificial pitches and both times we've, we've taken the decision to go with EPDM um, as opposed to a recycled rubber crumb not because we were concerned about you know any carcinogens or you know impact on the environment but more just to be seen to be aware of you know the, the research that has gone on and, and be seen to be make, you know taking the right steps in terms of you know if something does happen in five years time where they turn around and ban all rubber crumb we don't want to be um, having to outlay, you know, well, potentially six figures to yeah. take all of that rubber crumb out and put, put EPDM back in. So, you know, we, we neg negated that risk from the offset. I mean, one of the other problems that is the whole point of rubber crumb is that it, it was a massive environmental problem. <laughs> yeah. um, and we found another use for it. So, yeah, it's um, once you stop using it, it's, you know, en masse, yeah. you, you recreate 
the original problem, problem in a sense. Okay. Um, got a question that I think Jeff Webb has. Yeah, this is um, really looking at the our own media, ours included. Um, yeah. Are we all joined up and are we all getting the message out? Okay. Is that one for me, do you think? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think the media in general in B2B in the turf care sector is because we're all fighting our own corner and we're all competitive to one another. Um, what I think we're trying to do with turf business is promote some of the best stuff in the industry and get the industry talking through initiatives like this. Um, I think I know where your, your question is driving at. Should there be some kind of campaign and agreed objectives between a group of the media to say, let's get the best practices across, let's get the, uh, the great messages across, because that can help with some of what we were talking about earlier in terms of attracting people into the industry. Um, but I take it further than that. I think we should be looking at outside media in terms of the mainstream media, because there's a lot of sports coverage. Um, when the pitches and the playing surfaces tend to get mentioned, it's normally because there's been an issue or somebody's got a problem with it, um, rather than you know, praising the quality of the surfaces. And I'd, I'd like to try and find some way that we could get you know, all of the mainstream media to start looking at you know, how good our, our sports surfaces and particularly turf surfaces are uh, and how well recognised they are across the world. Um, I don't know if any of the other guys on the panel have got opinions on that. I think we don't do enough, nowhere near enough. We've got so much expertise and knowledge and you have these incidents happen at sports venues and... There should be that technical reply somehow. Um, it has to be a collective mm. because there is a lot of, let's say, skills and talents, but maybe we're not always necessarily the best trained to go on TV or radio, but this is where I think associations and organisations can help each other to either give training or find the right people. But I think it has to go right across the board. It's not just about addressing issues and problems, but it's also about selling our industry. I think people look at our industry and don't necessarily see golf or football, or rugby or cricket or, or horse racing. They see sports turf. And I think there has to be a point where we sell our industry and that's where I think collectively we should be helping each other to actually sell that. And then you go into this specialism of the different sports. Okay. Um, I'm going to just call on Jason Booth from the IGO and the audience here. And sorry to put you on the spot, Jason, but I remember a while ago you telling me how you used to kind of preempt any bad comments from the media. Yeah, uh, for those that didn't know, I used to work at Eddingley Stadium, Lee Rhinos and Yorkshire Carnegie. And uh, we were 12 months a year non stop uh, activity. And we used to go through some really hectic periods, some bad periods with an old soil pitch. And ultimately, we used to have major issues, but I used to communicate with our uh, media officer who then used to prompt uh, Sky Sports, who would inevitably be on live, of the issues that we had and encountered. So that was edited off at the pass. So that was one way that we tried to counteract any negativity that yeah. came our way. So if, as soon as the game kicked off, they would say how much rain we'd had, how many games we'd had, what we were trying to do to uh, counteract what the issues were. So it was like, as, like I said, we tried to edit off at the pass. So that was one of the ways that we used to manage it. Okay, thanks, Jason. Um, has anybody else got a, a follow-up on what else we can <coughs> do? I think, um, from again, from a horse racing perspective, the grounds was only brought in when there's a problem. If, if there is a complaint about <coughs> the condition of the track or um, there's a, a jockey's expected to win on an horse and it's lost, yeah. and then he blames overwatering or <coughs> something that the groundsman's done, and that's the only time... Um, you know, that once there is an issue, then they'll bring you in. When, but instead of them saying beforehand, as yeah. Jay's just alluded to, that, you know, it's, it's only when there's a problem that we're brought into the picture. Where the only other time I think I see a groundsman on horse racing is if you've got a big race and they get the guy out with a going stick and yeah. get somebody to talk about that. And yeah. it's normally Clark of the Course yeah. that does that. Yeah, yeah. Than a, a few times yeah. we've been on ITV, seem to be a bit, a bit better than Channel 4. that uh, they'll, they'll get you on and ask you your opinion and what yeah. you've done. But previous to that, it's when there's an issue and then they'll be asking you a question about the issue instead of, you know, how well the track road, so to speak. Okay. Well, so if I sum up on that one, we'd love to help. I'm not sure how willing the other guys from the other trade magazines would be 
to jump on board. I kind of guess that IOG with the groundsman and turf business, that's two out of the however many that you'd count in that mix. Um, but you know, if you want us to you know, join that, we'll certainly take part in it, Jeff. And I've told you that off, off the record as well. Where I'm coming from on it, I think what, what I'm picking up, and I think congrats to you for, for pushing this as well, is that um, there's certainly key issues that we all sign up to. So we're yep. not in different camps here. We're, we're actually all singing from the same hymn sheet. Uh, what we've got to do is join that hymn sheet up and you know, make us sing. And I think that's probably what we've been guilty of before. I mean, I, yeah. we find it quite interesting. Quite often, the, the reputation we've got internationally is better than the one we've got domestically. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's, it's an asset that you've got here. Um, and the other thing, I, I, I'm going to continue to talk us up, I'm afraid. <laughs> but the research we've just got has just found out that the sports turf sector in England alone is worth one billion. Mm -hmm. So I'd say take that fact away and go and promote that because that will make people sit up and think and take you more seriously. So there's a lot we can do together. We're happy to do it. Um, I think if Turf Business tried to lead it and bring the other magazines in the sector along, they would just not do it. But if an IOG or a bigger got together and said, let's do a kind of a, a little press initiative day and got us all in one room and, and got us talking, you might have more success with that. Okay, Chris. Um, it's an interesting question here on a completely different subject from um, Darren Burton. Um, yes, it was just to say that the, the standards shown on television are giving the wrong impression to the average sportsman and women. Um, should broadcasters be doing more to expand knowledge uh, to viewers of our challenges? Okay. Um, I guess football and golf are pretty high profile on that. Do you want to pick that one up in terms of you compared to the Masters? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's quite interesting is, is that with these tournaments, what better way to showcase what can happen but I guess the, the normal day-to-day -day player assumes that, well, that could happen at their own venue. And I think that's where the real struggle is. Um, I think we can all watch Grand, uh, a Grand Prix, but we're never going to associate that our normal family car can perform the same. But particularly in golf, that assumption is, well, if that's what they provided at Pebble Beach or Augusta, then, well, why can't we do that to our own venue? Um, and I think part of this has got to be, again, it's down to communication to the end user of actually what is possible. There are restrictions. Um, and we can't have, you know, for the UK, 2,500 golf courses, you can't have 2,500 Augustas. It's not financially, uh, as a business, it wouldn't be sustainable. We wouldn't have all those participants. So I think it's highlighting, one, the excellence we can do, but it's trying to communicate, well, there is actually a trade-off, a cost, pr uh, predominantly, into producing such stuff. Charles, is the... Uh, keep picking on you, sorry. Uh, is the, the look of the place becoming more important as part of the package that you're having to deliver? I mean, look, I look in this room and the people that I work with, and it's their job mm. is to produce the best with the resources they've got, and I don't think they can apologise for that, N nor I would say the minute they stop, <laughs> they're going to know about it instantly. So yeah. that's always going to happen. You know, there's always going to be people pay willing to pay to create perfection. Um, and in many senses, grass has become a sign of wealth and success in society, like perfect grass costs a lot of money. Um, and I guess as for how you deal with that, which is probably the next question you asked is, um, what I've found, if you, this is like marketing and sales, that's, that's all it is. People's attention's immensely short. And I've always found when I get introduced to people and they say, well, what do you do? And you say that it's interesting for about a minute and then they've walked off and stopped listening to me after about five, because it gets quite boring after a while. I think that's what we're trying to achieve here is that we're trying to get people interested in something that is it's interesting for a little bit and explain something that's quite technical, quite difficult and hold their attention at something that's not their core subject, it's their hobby. Um, and that's what's difficult. It, you know, when you're trying to, I guess, manage an expectation, it is difficult. And arguably, I think probably for the first 10 years of my life within golf um, or working life was... That was what I did. I had to explain and manage expectation um, to golf committees, you know, who demanded more um, and wanted what everyone else had but couldn't afford it, couldn't grasp it. Um, we, we tried immensely to explain, set up benchmarks of what you get per pound, you know, how many labour hours buys you something, 
you know, and that's a difficult task as well. So in terms of broadcasters, I think they're under enough pressure to um, probably advertise the things they're paid for, never mind these little issues. Mm. It's difficult. I mean, I guess yourselves in the governing bodies must have a hell of a time trying to capture their attention on what is a difficult subject. But if more could be done, I think anything that helps people's managers, uh, funders, bosses, members, customers, I guess, understand the challenges faced is, is good. Scott, um, social media has exploded in the last eight to ten years, should we say. Yeah? Um, everybody now seems to be a pundit and have an opinion. That's just made it, it tougher in terms of expectations, isn't it? I think a few years ago uh, it might have been, but I think there's been a shift in recent times, certainly at the, at the top level, where the groundsman now isn't so concerned about you know how green and pretty it looks, but he's now actually engaging with you know the sports science side of things and the actual performance parameters, and he's starting to think about how the players might actually perform on the surface. And as a result, like the standard of football has got better, and people aren't really concentrating on the pitch so much as long as the, mm. you know the, they're able to perform how they're supposed to. And if the pitch is performing within those parameters and the players aren't getting injured as much as they used to and they're not slipping about as much and the game flows better, then no one really talks about the pitch. They say, say before the game, like, oh, the pitch looks magnificent, and then it's not mentioned again. And as a groundsman, that, that's what you want, really. You know, no news is good news is, is like, you know, the catchphrase around here. Like, did we have a good camp? Well, no one's complaining, so it must have been great. Uh, and you know, that's, that's kind of what we're aiming for. So... Um, Social media a few years ago w was geared around like you know what pitch patterns we've got this week, yeah. and in, in their wisdom they they kind of knocked those out, taken that you know out of the equation, and now we can actually just get down to the business of looking at pitch performance and making sure that the product is as good as it as it can be. Okay. Aidy, do you get much feedback via social media? Um, I think uh, from professionals no but from betting because the amount of money spent on betting yeah. that if such a tipster has tipped an horse to win and it loses because he's gone public on social media to say this has won this this was going to win yeah. he's tipped it then he's got excuse he's obviously going to blame the track yeah. is it if whatever we've done if it's watered or not watered or said the going was good to firm and they think it was good then they start to get personal and then obviously right. you take it personal and then... Difficult. I've, I've, yeah, I've kind of stayed away from it, to tell yeah. you the truth, because, you know, these keyboard warriors, as we like to call them, that sat behind <laughs> the computers, <laughs> they've just sent a tip out, like I say, and someone spent 50 quid on it and yeah. they're looking for someone to blame. Um, and yeah. We're the easy target, I guess. Thank you, Doki. Chris, have we got anything else coming in? Uh, yeah, there's a question from Peter Bradburn. He says, um, how do we give credence to our environmental stewardship of the environments we look after when we face an ever-critical media and wider general public? Oh, OK. Any particular person want to pick that one up? I think that, you know, really for golf, we have to look at the geo and the Audubon um, system to really validate the work that we're doing. Um, I think, you know, we are going to go forward in a really difficult, tough system where, you know, our resources are being taken away and being restricted. I think there's greater scrutiny to make sure that as a turf manager that you're ticking all the right boxes and uh, being a good custodian to the site and produce all the goods and put up with the social media of the keyboard people thinking whether you're doing the right thing or, or wrong thing. I think it's validation, isn't it? As a turf professional, all I want to really do is do a good job and hopefully have it validated by or accredited by an organisation that's going to support what I'm doing. Um, I mean, everyone's looking for a witch hunt these days, so if you can cover your back, then I think that's, that's going to be quite key. Anyone else want to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, it's about relationships, isn't it? So, I mean, obviously a site like this, um, it's not just about the football pitches. There's obviously the estate as well. And, and, you know, we've got biodiversity action plans we need to adhere to. Um, and we have engagement with the, the Staffordshire Wildlife Trust and, and we have an ecologist that we, you know, that we pay to basically 
advise us on what we, you know, what we should be doing, when we should be doing it, and you just basically, as you say, being a, a good custodian of the of the estate, and um, you know, trying to look after the, the natural habitat as well as trying to maintain, an, you know, an elite training venue. Um, the two shouldn't really go hand in hand, but you know, it, it can work, and you know, and it's you know, I feel really privileged to be in such an environment. Maybe is it such an issue with the? Size of the race course you got? Yeah, <coughs> again with the public now, you've got to be a, a lot more open. Um, with it being an open site as we are, that you know, <coughs> people are crossing the racetrack at twenty four seven. You're working and be it irrigating, be it uh, deep tank compaction, any machinery on there. You've got dog walkers, um, even pest control. Some like rabbits, obviously. On, the, on a racetrack, you have to control it. And as being a, a land manager, as we are, um, with a city like York, <coughs> we've got a lot of people, even rat, you know, pest control, controlling rabbits. People have an opinion. We, you know, you've got to do it early morning when there's people not about, and because it's an open site, there's always people about. So every job you do now, it's you, you're under the microscope, and it's going to get worse. It's going to get harder and I mean, worse than that, you've got to be more open and you've got to explain why you've got to do what you do and you've got to explain it. You've got to be very open about it. The, the, the days of being able to go out early doing things and you know, con pest control, they, they've well and truly gone. You've got <laughs> to be open and everybody's questioning what you do as well. Even you know, just tree management around the site as well. Okay. Um, uh, We've got anything else from Myersco, perhaps? Or? Uh, yeah, I've got another one from uh, Myersco. Uh, the question is, what is the long-term plan for grassroots pitch development? Now, I know Scott's involved in something with that with the FA, but I also know Charles has had his home project that uh, I was really impressed with, actually. So should we throw that one to you first, Charles, and then I'll bring it over to you, Scott. Yeah, is that OK? I'll deflect <laughs> it straight to Mark Pover. <laughs> OK. <laughs> well, well, Charles, I, start. I, I don't know what the long-term plan is, but certainly... Yeah. Um, I mean, we, we we just sort of I guess we do a lot of work within football and I guess we I'd, I'd stopped playing football for a long time and probably wanted a way to get back involved with it personally and I guess an opportunity came up me and my mate was sat in a pub and his son at the time sort of was playing for this under tens team and we decided we were gonna what we do with the FA's worst worst nightmare was break away uh, <laughs> and set up our own club and, and we had a bit of a connection to Salford City so we just decided to set that up and um, and I guess we, there was no great plan but we just decided to, to, to take a site that was derelict and a de you know a company had just come in and, and re-leveled it receded it and buggered it off and, and left half a ton of glass and half a ton of brick in it as a courtesy but um, nevertheless we cracked on with that and, and I guess as one thing led to the other um, we just thought, well, if we're going to get involved, we'll, we'll do it well. Um, and I guess from that point of view, from my own experience of working in the sort of volunteer sector in New Zealand, I've worked for the New Zealand Turf Institute, travelling around. It was trying to come up with a system for us that, that, that dumbed down grass as much as possible. It sounds horrible, but mm. these people, they're, they're far better than me, far better than anyone else. They give up their time to do something, and, and turning some people into experts is difficult. What I found overseas in, in New Zealand was you, you'd, you'd turn up for two years and you'd, you'd have Barry would be brilliant. He'd learn and you could see this progression and then you'd turn up the third year and but like, where's Barry? Barry's gone. You know, mm. So then it's like, right, start again, we'll go again and, and you'd go again. Um, and that'll be a constant cycle and ongoing. So it was just trying to dumb it down as much as possible. So we came up with an agreement with the club where I just said, look, four volunteers, you mow it and you mow it four days a week whenever I tell you to mow it and we'll do everything else. Okay. So we did the fertilising and the seeding and the base, you know, the more technical stuff. We supplied them with the product. Um, and from there, it's sort of just gone on and on. And, and I guess the, the beauty of it is that, you know, Craig, we ended up employing. Um, yeah. He was just a volunteer who, who came along and, um, and stuck his hand up and hasn't stopped mowing since. <laughs> um, uh, but... It, from that, it just turned into this, you know, you turn up one day and they've striped it up. And it's like there. And, and it's funny, you talk about the TV and the presentation, but when you present that pitch for an under-10s game, which is, is, is fundamentally nothing, it's the most rewarding thing you'll ever do. 
and for the sake of giving up whatever, you know, 20 hours in a year, if anyone has the chance to do it, I'd highly recommend it. It would okay. be a real load of fun. So um, you make some good mates doing it as well. And somebody's made a career out of it as well, haven't they? So. His employer's not the best. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mark, I know he's in the room. If you don't want to catch the question that uh, Scott's thrown at you, feel free. But did you want to respond at all? Yeah, I can respond. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah we've, um, we've had uh, quite a lot of... Uh, input into um, it, trying to look at ways in which we can improve grassroots football pitches. Uh, it's become the number one issue uh, as part of the FA's grassroots survey year in, year out. So it's a consistent uh, theme that we're getting uh, and it's got uh, even more um, onerous and, and pressure on us because of the budget cuts that are happening at a local authority level. 83% of pitches are, that are used at the weekend for affiliated football are either local authority or education owned. So you know, there's a significant amount of pitches out there that are suffering. Um, so from the FA's point of view, we've, we've, um, we've got a, a strategy um, to improve uh, 20,000 pitches over the next 10, 10 years. Uh, we've got the investment to go with it. Um, and with that, it's not just about um, providing uh, grants and giving machinery to people. Um, as, as Charles has just mentioned, you need the, the volunteer workforce, but you need to ed educate them as well. So um, later on in August, we'll, we'll launch uh, what's known as a groundskeeping hive, um, which will be all about education, training, and um, getting people to understand. But it's also interactive, so very similar to today. Ask a question get a response back from, from uh, various professionals um, so that people can get immediate responses to the, to the problems that they're facing. Um, that strategy um, is starting to be, deli uh, be delivered um, <coughs> and the improvements we're going to make to those grass pitches are modest ones. Um, it goes back to the question that was asked earlier about you know, what do players expect. Yep. Um, part of our education has been to players and coaches and managers you know, why can't we have a pitch like uh, Lee's at the Etihad? Well, if you want to play five grand su subs every year, you can have that pitch. It's not a problem. But it's about, you know, people recognising the fact that that pitch costs money. Um, and if you're prepared to pay, then you can have it. If you're not, and you're only paying what you want to pay, we do know through surveying players that they are prepared to pay more for better. They don't want to pay more for something that's worse or, um, or stays the same. So by increasing modest amounts of um, improvements into the grass pitch, we can make that difference. Um, and that's the, that's the sort of uh, t uh, tech line, if you like, that we're, we're going with. And off the back of that, to get immediate responses and to be able to measure pitches and to be able to provide that um, advice and information through uh, partners with the Institute of Groundsmanship and the, the regional pitch advisors we have, uh, we're developing a, a, a digital assessment tool so yeah. that people can use and, and take photographs of, of the information we need to be able to provide the, uh, the information back to just give some of that modest uh, improvement to the pitches. It yeah. doesn't need to be significant because the players don't, uh, you know, when they realise that, it, you know, you can't have uh, an Etihad, you've, you can, but you can have something better that's got grass on it um, and that, uh, you know, don't, doesn't get as many games called off, that's fundamentally where they're coming from. They just want to play week in, week out, if they can. And if it's snowed, they recognise they can't play, or if it's frosty, they recognise they can't play, but they would like to play even when it's raining um, and, and get the season over in, uh, in April instead of playing, uh, you know, sort of 12 or 16 games in, uh, in the, you know, at the back end of April and beginning of May. Okay. So, yes, the FA has a programme. We have a, a strategy for improvement, and um, we're underway with that. Did anybody on the panel want to add to that? Okay, thank you for that, Mark. That was a really good answer. Thank you for taking the question, being put on the spot. Chris, have we, I think we've got time for maybe one, maybe two more, if you've got anything. Okay, if there's time for two more, I've got uh, one that's linked to this morning's discussion, actually, about um, career progression and um, salaries. So, anonymous question. Uh, can sports, particularly golf, uh, afford and sustain salary increases considering a downturn in golf participation? That's one for you, I think, to start off with. Yeah. yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, we live in a society now where people have high expectations. They, you know, we were talking this morning about, you know, getting an apprentice, they get qualified, and then 
you know, they could spend a number of years in a, an assistance position and they just don't generate enough money to buy a house and, and have a quality of life that they want. So there's a real a kind of drive that, that their careers are, um, um, they can earn better money uh, through better recognition. But there's also a point, you know, very much in golf where there is a downturn and, you know, how does those businesses that are kind of just about affording to provide golf, you know, they're not going to be able to afford to pay more people. So I think, you know, I quite agree that um, the, the guys at the level two, level three level should be paid a lot more than, than what they're being paid. But is the business going to be there to sustain it? That would be, you know, that's a hard thing. But then this comes back down to this this whole profile about, you know, our industry. We need to show that we're really good at what we do, and there is a value to being paid more. Um, is the end user going to accept pay more? Um, uh, you're possibly not in the same situation, but I'm sure many clubs are competing in their local for locality, locality sorry, for membership or green fees. Obviously, if you've got considerably better quality playing surfaces than course cool speed down the road, you're going to attract more people. Isn't there a financial argument to make to the, the committee? Uh, there is, but unfortunately with a lot of committees, they might just serve one year on their term. They certainly don't want to be remembered the committee that actually cost uh, the, the golfers' membership more. So I think it's very it's a complex issue. Um, I don't really know how it's eternally resolved. I mean, this industry historically has always had this issue of doing a job, working long hours, and not really being um, paid for it. And, and this is that transitional change. And, we, and the whole education, the whole media aspect, it all, it all ties in together. And you know, we're saying about selling our skills on social media much better. Well, yeah. that's got to underpin why we should be paid more, why you know, we don't lose people to the industry to go into other industries because you know, they want to buy their own house. They want to be able to go on holidays. They want to feel financially they're on a level par with their friends and their mates and their, and, and their family. That is going to be painful. And, but we're now working in a time where people are quite happy to walk away because it doesn't matter. They, they don't carry the burden of pride, which I grew up with. Yeah. You know, the thought of being unemployed was like shock horror. You know, we're, we got a new generation of people. It's like, yeah, all right, whatever. They don't, they don't care. And I think that is going to be a real hard nut to crack. Okay. Chris, one more if you've got one. Okay, it's a great question to finish with. Another anonymous one. The anonymous uh, person asks, what's the biggest positive you see in the industry at the moment? Okay, let's start with AD on that one, shall we? Um, I think, from again, from my perspective, it's expectations um, from uh, from from a groundsman's point of view is that I've been very fortunate that I've been supported by a, a you know at York and at Aintree similar that I was backed up by a, a board and they shared what my expectations were and. Their expectations were very similar. Was very fortunate. I think that's been a very positive side from my my perspective. Okay. Um, I think what's frustrating, what I see from other other groundsmen, is that when their expectations are not quite seen the same as what the management. Okay, unrealistic expectations. Yeah, indeed. Come back to that again. Yeah. Um, Scott, did, do you want to make a point on that one? Uh, yeah, for me, it's it's. It's always incredible, like, you know, historically we've just been regarded as, you know, the guys who cut the grass and mark the white lines or, you know, cut the greens and tees and whatnot. And uh, it always amazes me how, like, innovation and technology finds its way into this industry and how, you know, we're, we're sitting here this morning talking about autonomous mowers and, you know, artificial intelligence and stuff. And, and, and you know, for guys who go out and cut the grass every day, like, you know, it, it's pretty amazing that, you know, we're able to embrace these technologies and, and take them on board and, you know, push the, drive that industry forward. And I think that's always really prevalent that, you know, the, the guys in this, in this industry are that passionate and dedicated that they don't just rest on their laurels and sit on it. They do want to drive it forward and, and always improve on what they've got. And I think that's something that, you know, that is a real positive, that it never, it never sits still. It never, you know, we're never, 
sit there and go, I'm, I'm done. Like, I, I just can't do any better. Like, you know, there's always like, well, that, you know, that could be slightly better. What, what could we do? How could we make that more efficient? How could we make that more cost effective? And, and, and you go again every day and, you know, I see that every day ac across the industry. I don't ever really see anyone just, you know, sitting and, and settling for what they've got. So, so a, a constant innovation and a constant desire to improve, yeah? Yeah. Charles? Football, I would say just the standard. I mean, if you got, you've only got to go back and stay up till one in the morning and watch <laughs> Sky, EPL, like early yeah. 2000s, yeah. and you see what's been achieved yeah. in a decade. Uh, as a collective industry, you can physically see what's happened. And that's, that's product, that's groundsman, that's research, it, that's everything that's rolled into what is on there. Golf, I think, I think what's impressive for me in terms of two polar opposite scenarios is people are achieving probably similar standards with 55,000 disposable spends is what they used to achieve with 90, 10 years yeah. ago. You know, like they, they've worked out how to achieve as, you know, as good as um, what they had just, just by pure determination at, at a moderate intermediate level, you know, and in two aspects and in two different ways that they've met up with challenges that have been put in front of them. Lee, we'll give you the last word. I think if I look back over my career, I think, you know, we've actually come to the point now where we actually understand thresholds, whereas a lot of the standards that we produce now are, are measurable. Um, I think social media is helped by um, people being able to share ideas, communicate far better. I mean, I think now to have your career again now, the opportunity is just off the scale, whereas before 20, 30 years ago, you didn't know actually what those opportunities were because you either heard it from someone or you didn't hear it at all. And I think a lot of stuff is now measured and I think there's a, there's a point where you could justify your standard, your efficiencies, and it's like Charles saying, is, is that you know, actually we're probably spending less because we've now, we can reduce our waste. Um, as I mentioned earlier on, as ever, our industry is just full of problem solvers. And I think now we're trying, we're starting to prove that we're actually very good at problem solving.